Welcome to Entering the Void, our series on the metaphysical aspects of the times that we're living in. My name is Mark Bind. I'm one of the founders of the Moyo Talks platform. And joining me today is Dr. Yvette de Villiers, a holistic well-being consultant with a PhD in metaphysical philosophy. In our previous episode, we talked about the nature of consciousness. And today we take the conversation further into the laws of attraction. Yvette, what are the laws of attraction? Well, that is a very interesting question. And um, like most questions, the answer is far more complicated than the question. Um, I'd like to begin by just saying that a lot has been said about the laws of attraction, especially lately. You know, and um, although I think that most of what is out there around the laws of attraction is probably completely true, um, there is an undermining, underlying element to that that is um, less spoken about and a lot less is known about, and that is the laws of manifestation. Okay, can you explain that for us? Yes, so before we talk about the laws of attraction, we actually need to, to take a closer look at the law of manifestation. And the law of manifestation basically says, I cannot manifest that which I am not. Okay. Okay. So if you take that principle, I cannot manifest that which I am not. Okay. Um, and if we stand still there for a moment, then you'll see that a lot of people want to use the laws of attraction to somehow manifest something different than what they actually are. Normally love or abundance. So it's something that they are not or don't have. Yeah. Okay. So it's quite tricky because we have to really understand, firstly, what we are and what we are not. And secondly, that we cannot manifest what we are not. And the law that follows on to that is what we resist persists. Okay. Okay. So if we are trying to attract something that we don't have or are not, like fat if we're thin or thin if we're fat or happy if we're sad or in love if we're not or wealth if we feel ourselves to be poor, yeah. what we are actually doing is we are resisting that which we are. So we're resisting eating or we're resisting wealth or we're resisting love. So we're coming resisting from... Resisting anger. We are resisting. So we are trying to attract something different from what is real for us at that point in time. So we're coming from a place of resistance. Yeah. And what we resist persists. Okay. And that is a lot of time when, when people say the laws of attraction don't work. Um, but it's not actually the laws of attraction that doesn't work. It's the laws of manifestation that are at work. Can you see? Yes. So that is actually, we, we need to stand still a little bit at the laws of manifestation. Okay. And, um, and we're going to do that in today's podcast. Um, these are quite abstract concepts, and I think it's just important to also mention again they are metaphysical concepts. So they're a little bit further out than your normal scientific or your even your human sciences, um, although they are well observed and they do actually work. Yeah. So I'm going to share some metaphysical concepts with you today, which are quite abstract, um, and then I'm going to turn that back to ultimately give an exercise um, around the laws of attraction. Right, I'm looking forward to it. Okay. So the first thing that we well, that we need to look at or examine if we look at the laws of manifestation is our state of being. And this draws on our last two podcasts where we spoke about the self um, and the nature of consciousness. So we are either in a state of unconscious being or conscious being. So we are either unawakened or we are awakened. Okay. Okay. If we are in an unawakened state, we are usually in a state where we are manifesting our world from a subconscious state of post-trauma. And that is very interesting because post-traumatic stress classically is only attributed to soldiers coming back from war. But in my experience and in my knowledge, most of us, by the time we are adults, are living in some kind of state of post-trauma. So all of us have a degree of unresolved post-traumatic stress that comes from traumas in our childhood that we are either unresolved about or unaware of. So can you give an example of one such trauma? 
No, sadly, especially the ones we are unaware of, often is physical or sexual abuse. Yeah. And the reason for that is because of the ego um, being the protector that it is, and we covered that in our previous podcasts as well, it will hide the trauma. So if we have to keep focusing on things that happened to us in the past that make us unhappy and that bring us pain, um, we can't live functionally in the present. Mm -hmm. So what the ego does is it actually hides these traumas from us. And a lot of the time when I start working with people in my practice, they will come up with issues that they have in the present, unhappinesses, um, ways that they view things and have absolutely no idea why. Um, the follow-on question to that then would be, do you remember your childhood? And a lot of the time the answer would be, I remember very little. Mm -hmm. And that is a clear cue that there would be trauma in the childhood that the ego has actually hidden from the individual in order for them to be reasonably functional from a survivalist point of view. So we're not at well-being, we're at survival, which is the brief of the ego. Yeah. So the ego's only concern is for the, 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 the human to survive. And in order to survive, certain things need to be forgotten, um, especially if they were traumatic. Um, and then you get it that, that a person is not necessarily particularly happy, um, they're functional in the world, they're not fulfilled, and they don't know why. Yeah. So physical or sexual trauma is quite a big trauma. How, how severe does the trauma need to be to be playing a role in this law of manifestation? So um, that is a very, very interesting question, and it has a, two answers. Um, the first is that the size of the trauma or the impact of the trauma, how big the trauma is, is incredibly relevant to who the person is. So something that is incredibly traumatic for one person is not necessarily traumatic for another person. So that is quite important to, di to differentiate. And then the other thing that is um, always important to, to bring into the picture, especially when you speak about physical or sexual abuse, is that the degree to, to which the abuse left a lasting impression on the individual often has more to do with the kind of support network that they have around them at the time than it necessarily has to do with the incident. So obviously your very severe sexual abuse like rape or violent rape is something in and of itself. Um, and there's no dispute how traumatic that is. It comes in when there is what we call soft abuse, um, which people often then discard and think was not actually that traumatic because it was someone they knew or it was an older child that played with them and they think that they, they are fine. But if their relationships with their support network, in other words, their parents, um, or older siblings were not of a nature where they could disclose what had happened and they could have support um, in carrying and processing what had happened to them, the trauma becomes quite deep, potentially. And that is the aspect that is often ignored or discarded, is what was your family life like um, when whatever happened to you happened? What was your relationship with your parents like? Could you trust your parents? Did you tell your parents? These are the kind of questions that I usually go through with someone when something like this comes to light. And then you need a much fuller picture in order to see how big the trauma actually was. Yeah. If that makes, makes any sense. Okay. So you mentioned that what we manifest is our state of being. Yes. Can you take us further through this state of being? Yes. So one of the elements of, of the state of being which plays an incredibly big role in manifestation is a condition called focal dystonia. So I'm going to describe the condition for you as best I can. And then I would like to see if our viewers could start possibly identifying this for themselves because it's incredibly um, liberating and, and very interesting when we start to see oh, do we actually suffer from this condition because it's actually quite common. So focal dystonia is a, a phrase that was coined by a leading psychiatrist in the field of neuroscience called Norman Doy in the early 90s. And um, what he did is he, he took a condition that is classically observed with, for instance, professional guitar players, where they um, play rifts often and for hours on end and for years at a time, 
where they merge the second, where they third and their fourth finger. And then eventually they cannot move those fingers apart anymore. So what has happened is the brain has then created the one map for both the fingers. And it, it has economized the space, in other words, and see those fingers as one and as one function. And they then have to have physiotherapy and um, occupational therapy in order to separate the fingers. And he then went and he looked at the psychological phenomenon of, of people having traumatic experiences or events, either heavily traumatic or repeatedly traumatic in childhood. And he saw there that the brain also maps. So the brain also saves space and maps incidences and events and impressions that normally have nothing to do with each other together. So let's say, for instance, you had a stepfather that was particularly abusive. And every time before coming into the house, you would know what is waiting for you there. And in front of your house, there's a red post box. So years later, you would walk down the street, you would see a red post box, and your trauma would trigger. So that is what focal dystonia is. And so what happens a lot for a lot of us in adulthood is we will have disproportionate reactions to stimuli in our adult world that we can't explain or understand. So somebody would criticize us or somebody would say something to us and we would have a huge reaction to it and afterwards look at our reaction and not really understand why or where it comes from. So the reaction is far greater than the actual stimulus. It's far greater than the stimulus and the reason is because for the brain if it looks the same it sounds the same, it seems the same, it must be the same. And it will elect the exact same trauma response that we had years ago in childhood that maybe from the outside we didn't deem particularly traumatic, but we experienced it as trauma on the inside. And we now have this situation of focal dystonia where we're basically transpersing our, our, our reactions to that trauma onto a current event. Okay. And at the same time, the mind is trying to hide the trauma so that we can survive, exactly. but we're having these reactions to these unrelated triggers. Exactly. And this is where we come up with what I said to you previously, where people come and see me about the other guy, because it has to be the other person that has the problem. It can't be me because I'm fine. Yes. So why is the other person worth criticizing? Exactly. Exactly. And that is one of the biggest revelations in personal relationships, because Oftentimes people would come to me and they would say to me, I have a problem in my relationship. Um, I'm awakened, I'm conscious, so I know it must be me. But they still don't know what that actually is or how that works because their ego has hidden the trauma. Yeah. Do you see? So, so they're awakened, they're conscious, they know there's something going on, but they don't actually understand how that works. Yeah. And that is what we talk about when we talk about the law of manifestation. And now, um, before we end this, this episode, we're going to come back to an exercise that people can do. But before we get to the exercise, what does it take then to actually manifest accurately or to manifest what we truly desire? So there are a couple of elements to that. If you can remember, I think in our second podcast, we spoke about the photon belt and we spoke about, um, we spoke about mass we spoke about os oscillation frequency and also about coherent thought. And we, we touched on mass very briefly. We spend most of our time on oscillation frequency and on coherence. So when it comes to the laws of manifestation and ultimately the laws of attraction, the, the sort of X factor that we need is mass. So mass in the metaphysical sense is very interesting. Um, I like to call it the weight of our soul. Um, and it's interesting there because they did experiments with people just before and after death by weighing them on incredibly sensitive scales. And the body actually weighs slightly less after death when we believe metaphysically the soul has departed. What we also believe is that in these past traumas, every time we experience a trauma, especially in our formative years, in the first 25 years of life, um, because that's how long it takes for the brain to actually fully form. So it's called the formative years. Every time we experience a trauma, then we leave a part of ourselves behind. So this 
um, plan that the ego has made to hide from us that which has upset or traumatized or damaged us comes at a cost. And the cost is that we leave a part of ourselves behind in that memory being hidden from us. So what happens then is the mass of our consciousness. So how much of our consciousness is actually present in our bodies becomes less and less and less. With every unresolved trauma that has fragmented our soul and left parts of us behind. So now you get people who desperately want to, to, to attract a different experience from the one that they're having, but their ability to do so is diminished because their mass, so the weight of their soul, is so light. Would you also say that their coherence is reduced because of those post-traumatic stresses? Definitely, Mark. And the reason for that is it's very hard work to hide things from yourself. Yeah. So when I start debriefing possible post-trauma um, or post-traumatic reality with people, um, I challenge them to start observing their thoughts. And that's a little bit what our exercise at the end of this program has got to do with. And what they, what they observe is that they think about that which they believe didn't happen more often than they think they did. Mm -hmm. And that is very hard work. And what it does is it causes incoherent thought. Yeah. And so you're sitting with low mass, low coherence, and what these two things do is they slow us down. So they slow down the oscillation frequency of the subatomic particles of our being. And with low frequency, um, a, a low oscillation frequency, low mass, and low coherent thought, you cannot get enough energy together to cause a critical mass shift. Okay, and if you want to experience or attract something different from what you're doing at the moment, you need to shift your reality. You need a critical mass shift. And in order to do that, you need high coherence, high mass, and high escalation frequency. So what steps would you recommend for somebody who is uh, wanting to go through this process to, to heal these lost parts of their soul? So to, in order to answer that, I think I want to just skip a little bit ahead and just look at, at the value system, okay? And it's a little bit putting the, putting the why before the how, but it's relevant because we need to look at what we actually want to manifest. And here we are back at our conversation that we had about the value systems in the world that are currently shifting. And we're shifting out of a value system where material wealth and financial security used to be the be all and the end all of when it's going well with us. And we slowly but surely moving into a space where well-being and blissful experience that creates high life force energy is becoming far more important to us. And the reason for that is that if we are going to do all this work and we are finally going to end up with the laws of attraction and we're going to only want to attract material wealth and financial security, we're going to find that we do that at the cost of our well-being. And then you end up in a place where you are in, in the second part of your life where your fulfillment becomes more and more important to you and you've sacrificed your health, you've got all the money in the world, but you're not well and you're not feeling fulfilled. So for me, when I work with people wanting to attract or manifest a different life than the one they have, I work with quite clearly defining what their value system is around what they want to attract, okay? And the interesting thing there, once again, if your, if your post-traumatic stress is not integrated, if you're suffering from focal dystonia, you can have all the wealth in the world. You can have all the financial security in the world. You can have a beautiful partner. Um, you can live in a fantastic place and you cannot be happy. You know, you can react every time to when anybody sees anything that triggers you with a reaction that alienates people and that isolates you. And I suppose the opposite is also true. You could be uh, in a place with very little and still have complete inner peace and happiness. You can. And that is a very interesting thing for me that has, has come out of conversations um, post 2020. Uh, because more and more people have said to me, you know, um, I have money, but I can't spend it. I can't go for retail therapy. Um, I, or I don't have money. 
and I am home and my home is not very big, um, but I have my pets, mm -hmm. you know, or I have a family member or I have somebody close or I Zoom with someone that I love once a week. I can't see them, but I can see, connect with them. And it's almost as if 2020 in that sense has really shifted our value system where people just started valuing the little things again and started getting more out of relationships and love and, and community and communion with others. We previously, in that previous value system, it was just this drive towards this material wealth and security. And we sacrificed our relationships. We sacrificed our relationship with our pets, um, with our loved ones, with our family members. And then we augmented that with money, you know, which if you look at it, it's a very skewed kind of value system. And then eventually we paid for it with our house. Mm -hmm which is hopefully something we're now completely moving away from. Yeah, and I suppose if we look at this on a collective level, it's quite interesting that the 2020 crisis was about health. It was, well exactly, exactly. And I think that if you take the virus out of it, the fact that it was a health crisis for me is absolutely prophetic. Because if you talk about people, especially if you talk about people in the Western culture, you know, health is last on the list. You know, only when they start having health problems in their 40s and in their 50s, does health seem to, to sort of move up on the list. And from being a, a sort of well-being consultant, I can tell you that it's a little bit late mm -hmm. because now the damage has already been done. You know, it's very prophetic for me that it was an actual health crisis. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the more your health goes down, the more your well-being goes down and the less your life force energy is. Mm -hmm. Um, and we touched a little bit on life force energy in our previous podcasts, um, it's our divine spark. It's the part of us that makes us feel alive. And it's that part of us that experiences experiential bliss. And I think if you, if you speak to anybody who's really sort of taken the time in their spiritual practice and in their well-being practice to connect with nature, to meditate, to ask for help, to really, really activate and energize their life force energy, they'll tell you that there's nothing that money can buy that can give you that experience. Mm -hmm. You know, you can sit in a garden, you can listen to nature sounds, you can take in the perfection of nature, and you can be in a completely blissful state. You can't go and buy that in a shop window. You know, and that for me is the exciting part because it means that health and well-being is actually within the reach of every person currently incarnate on earth. Yeah. It's a state of being, yes. and it's completely attainable for each and every one of us. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it written somewhere, there's, there are two ways to be wealthy, to have more or to need less. Very interesting, Mark, and I think very true. Yeah. It's exceptional. And the other thing that's interesting is, as your physical health declines, um, in that old paradigm, it actually becomes harder for most people to earn material wealth. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it implodes on itself. Yeah. You know, so it's not a system that is sustainable. You know, and, and that for me is the exciting thing because it feels to me that your average human being, every single person on earth through 2020 has had to reevaluate their value system. They've had to relook how they, they spend their lives, what they spend their time on, you know, what they focus on, what is important to them. Um, unfortunately, through the sad reality of the loss of life that we've experienced during 2020 and are still experiencing, people have said to me that they now value their relationships so much more because they understand how finite those relationships are and, and that somebody can be here today and gone tomorrow. You know, and, and rude awakening as it is, I think it's something that we, we kind of needed to remember. You know, that the people are not just there forever. You know, I think I mentioned in the interview of people telling me that they've spoken to long lost rel relatives or estranged parents or siblings merely out of this realization that that person can be gone through this pandemic. And it's healed so much in terms of our emotional and spiritual connections with one another. Yeah. So should we move on to the exercise? Then? Yes, so the exercise is based on the principle I cannot manifest that which I am not. Okay. And just to give you a little bit of background there, Mark, because I think it's quite relevant. 
If we speak about childhood trauma, this process of the ego needing for us to survive um, and this, this sort of plan that it makes once we've experienced trauma um, to help us to be able to cope with life um, creates for it to, um, to create for us a set of what we call paradigms. So just to give you an idea of what a paradigm is, a paradigm um, in my language is the walls and the floor and the roof of the house in which our belief system lives. Okay. okay, so our belief system is quite easy to understand and to question. So we'll question if we need a renovation or we'll question if that sofa is still relevant and if we should change it to a new, more updated model. But we don't always question the walls and the floor and the roof of our house. Yet these paradigms are actually from where we manifest our world. Okay, because they are our I am paradigms. And these paradigms are based on plans that the ego made in our early life to not get hurt by life. So there are I-isms. Okay, so I am not worthy, or I am not loved, or I am not wanted. And what the ego does is he turns it into power, the ego turns it into powers. So somebody starts using that paradigm of the message that they kept on getting from their environment. And that those messages are not always deliberate. You know, a child can get a, a message of I am not wanted or I am not loved or, or I am not relevant from parents who are just busy working all the time, mm -hmm. earning money. You see? So that whole system that we were in left us with this brokenness inside where our paradigms that houses our belief systems are not really always that positive. Those paradigms are designed to keep us safe. They're not actually designed to make us well. All right, so you are not going to manifest a world in which there is well-being for you if your paradigms are still there to keep you safe, but not necessarily there to keep you well. So what I do with this exercise is I ask you to repeat three paradigms for yourself for 21 days, and then observe what comes to the surface. The paradigms are, I am wanted, I am loved, I am worth it. I am, I am wanted, wanted, I am loved, I am worth it. Okay, so these are paradigms that might perhaps be shifting my previous paradigm. You know, this is the interesting thing. And the reason I use these particular three paradigms is that a child who is either in an abused environment or a neglected environment or a combination of both. Remember, a child can experience neglect with parents who are just too busy. They are nice people. They are doing their best, but they are just too busy. And the child can walk away with paradigms saying, I am not wanted, I am not loved, and I am not worth it. So these are very, very basic principles that if they, are, if they are echoed and confirmed by the parents in the childhood, usually by the age of six or seven, which is a sort of neuroplastic, neuroplastic growth spurt, um, the child walks out with this as their truth. And you generally find people who have the positive paradigms. I'm wanted, I'm loved, and I'm worth it. Down there as the roof and the floor and the, and the walls of their house you generally find them to be very balanced, very successful people in a high state of well-being. What you also find is for the opposite to be true. So people who are at the basis of their, their, their mind, so in those formative years of by six and seven, have, have decided that they are not wanted, not loved, and not worth it, will even manifest quite good material wealth, but they will not be in a state of well-being. So the exercise is to repeat for yourself as often as you can think about it for a period of 21 days, these three paradigms as if they are true for you. So I am wanted, I am loved, and I am worth it. And then you said to observe your thoughts. And then observe your thoughts because I cannot manifest that which I am not. So if I do not believe that I am wanted, loved, and worth it, Memories are going to start surfacing to the contrary. The thoughts and memories are going to start surfacing to the contrary of that. 
And what you now need to do is rather than before, where you were doing all that work to suppress those memories and to not think those thoughts, you need to observe them. You need to witness them. You need to acknowledge them. I like it for you to write them down, for a person to journal and to write them down um, because of the, the observation, because of the witnessing, because that's that, that process of writing down. So you are saying to yourself, it did happen. It's not happened. This mm -hmm. is what I thought. This is what I felt. This is what I experienced. And this is incredibly powerful because just through this, this, this externalization, just through the switching the light on and giving it the name, we're 50% here. Yeah. And we are 50 and even in some cases more. We, we just want that acknowledgement to happen. So, so that process of 21 days, I'm wanted, I'm loved, I'm with it, and seeing what comes to the surface and saying to ourselves, it's not nothing. It did happen. It is true. This is my past reality. Just that bringing to light is incredibly healing. And then there's a, a, a sort of completion to that where we basically just look at it and we say to ourselves, that was then, this is now, now is different. And the second part of the exercise is to start releasing the focal dystonia because the subconscious does not understand time. Okay. So what we want to do with the second part of the exercise is we want to actually get those brain maps to separate again and say to ourselves that then when I felt unwanted, unloved, and not worth it, one of the three or all three was then. Now I am deciding that I am wanted, I am loved, and I am worth it because I'm giving this to myself. And now it's different. And that is the beginning of manifesting that which I am. And from this place, we can now start to attract whatever we want. So the manifestation then becomes more conscious, more successful, more powerful? It becomes more true in terms of that which we then attract actually making us happy. Can you see? So if you now move on to the laws of attraction, then you can literally imagine what it is that you want and it will manifest in your world. And it will make you happy because at a basis... So at your baseline, at your at your at your um, your paradigm level, you are starting to enforce for yourself: I am wanted, I am loved, I am loved. So you'll be using the law of attraction in alignment with the law of manifestation. That's you'll be exactly trying right. to attract that which you are. Yes, and what I do um, to check myself to see that I'm aligned and that I am um, I am making true for myself that I'm wanted, I am loved, I am worth it. Um, I put these little testers out. I sort of find something that I would like to discover or see or attract. And then I kind of start putting that out into the universe. And I did that this recently um, in that there is, um, there is the story of the elusive golden koi. So I'm not sure if you know koi fish. Most of us do. Um, somebody said to me the other day, it's not a fish, it's a being. <laughs> because... Um, I find them very therapeutic to watch. I find them to be incredibly ancient, beautiful beings, um, completely at one with their environment. And there is a koi which is completely golden. So it literally is a golden koi, a golden fish. And I've always wanted to see these golden koi. And I, I thought I'd need to go to the East to do that. I actually always thought that I would need to go to, to Japan or somewhere to see one of these golden kois. But I then also decided to test my own ability to attract um, using the laws of manifestation and attraction. And I just started sort of putting out there the golden koi, golden koi. And then very interestingly, on the 18th of March, which is exactly three months since I had contracted COVID and, and went into this process of working very, very deeply with what it's bringing up for me and what could still be unresolved in my past um, around it, to having this disease, I saw a golden koi. Um, and I took a picture of it. And at the end of this podcast, I'm going to share that picture with our with our watchers. Oh, fantastic. And I think we can also invite um, the audience to send in their results if they it's go through this process and, um, and do the test and start to manifest uh, yes. and, and attract something. I mean, I'd be very interested to hear how people do. No, I think that's a wonderful exercise. Yeah. Yeah, Tolivet, thank you very much for 
sharing your, your wisdom and experience um, in this episode, The Law of Attraction. I look forward to joining you in our next episode. Great. Thanks, Mark.